Next on Currents News, an amazing story that spans generations. It's about two babies and one nurse at a Catholic hospital. The fight to protect young people from abuse is gaining ground. An exclusive report from the Vatican. An undercover look at an overcrowded facility set up in China to combat the coronavirus crisis. Plus, Lent is about to begin. Bishop DiMarzio is here and there are new regulations you need to know. The news starts right now. I was there then and I'm here now. Nurse Lisa McGowan at New Jersey's St. Peter's Hospital talking about caring for a dad and his son three decades apart. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. The amazing coincidence taking place in the hospital's neonatal intensive care unit. The newborn's dad says he knew God was watching over his family when his son was born 10 weeks early. Currents News Emily Druby explains why from New Brunswick. He's freaking out completely. These three forever bonded by fate. It started when Renata and David's son Zane was born early. Yeah, 10 weeks. 10 weeks. On January 30th, the premature baby was admitted to the NICU at the Children's Hospital at St. Peter's, a Catholic hospital in New Brunswick, the same place where David had been treated 33 years before. He was also born a preemie. Feeling nostalgic after Zane's birth, the family looked at David's old baby book. That's when they had a revelation. I'm literally screaming, who is this? And he was like, oh, that's, that's, that's me and the, the nurse. And I said, who does this look like? And he was like, what? No, it can't be her. It can't be her. Renata saw this photo of her husband being held by a nurse. I would always ask my mom, who's this lady? in my baby book holding me and like my mom was like oh that's the nurse like that was your nurse she was amazing that nurse lisa mcgowan the same woman who had been taking incredible care of zane a crazy coincidence i could have been on the whole other side of the unit and never even saw them let alone take care of him david says it was more than a coincidence it was divine intervention from god in his mother whom he lost in 2004. That happening basically just reassured me that my mom is watching over us. I said I was like watching over her grandson from heaven. I said I was like watching over her son. It's often difficult for parents of preemies as they have to leave their most precious gift in the hands of the hospital. Not having him with me is one of the hardest things. Knowing Lisa is there has become a source of comfort for David and Renata. I was there then and I'm here now and, and hopefully giving them that comfort that everything's going to be okay. They say a nurse takes care of both the patient and their families. And for this family, that was especially true. In New Brunswick, Emily Druby, Currents News. President Trump staged a campaign rally in Las Vegas late this afternoon, the day before Democrats vote in the Nevada caucuses. God bless. This is the third event out west this week. Trump already packed arenas in Arizona and Colorado. The campaign is saying it's a little counter programming. As for the Democrats in Nevada, they're going to use calculators tomorrow with paper and pens as a backup. I am very confident that uh, when it all comes down to it, our precinct chairs will be able to utilize this caucus calculator. And again, it helps them to reduce any human error. That's Nevada's Democratic Party chair, confident that tomorrow's caucuses won't be a debacle like we saw in Iowa. William McCurdy says volunteers have been trained on the new caucus calculators and they're ready to go. The candidates are doing some last minute campaigning before tomorrow's vote. Senator Elizabeth Warren is calling on Mike Bloomberg to release people who have made accusations against him from their non-disclosure agreements. I wrote up a release and covenant not to sue and all that Mayor Bloomberg has to do is download it, I'll text it, <laughs> sign it, and then the women or men will be free to speak and tell their own stories. And if I can, During the debate, Bloomberg admitted the agreements exist but refuted her request to cancel them. It appears Russia may try to meddle in the 2020 election to get President Trump reelected. The intelligence community told lawmakers the meddling will include hacking, weaponizing social media and attacks on election infrastructure. 
this angered uh, Republicans on the committee who, who pushed back. And when the president learned about this briefing, he was very upset. Reports say President Trump was frustrated that House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff was allowed to attend the hearing. This flu season has been tough, especially on kids, but there is some good news tonight. The flu shot is working. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC says the vaccine reduced doctor visits associated with flu by 45%. 105 children have died from the flu in the U.S. so far this season, a season that is likely to continue for several more weeks. And tonight, the CDC is confirming 34 cases of coronavirus here in the U.S. While in China, they're trying to contain the outbreak. David Culver takes us inside a converted field hospital in Wuhan. You are walking through one of several Wuhan field hospitals. This one, a converted exhibition hall. It is aimed to contain the spread of the novel coronavirus. Notice bed after bed after bed, people crammed in just feet apart from one another. Portable toilets, a bit messy inside, and trash cans overflowing. You can see the piles of used face masks. The woman who toured via video chat through this field hospital tells us the conditions here worry her. Fearing repercussions, she asked we call her Lisa Wong, not her real name. There's a great danger of cross-infection, and there are people who are healthy and got taken here by mistake. Chinese state media aired images of the same field hospital before it opened, much cleaner inside. Wang says she and others here are recovered and healthy, and were still forced into the facility. I'm very angry because I feel I shouldn't have come here. I'm very anxious. I want to be back home soon. Wong contracted the virus in late January, but fully recovered within a couple of weeks. Both her CT scan and swab test results show that she twice tested negative. But officials still bust Wong and several others to the field hospital for further treatment, despite her negative test results. They told me if I refused, they would force me to go. Bo Hanlin faced a similar rounding up in Wuhan. His wife was a confirmed case, so he was listed as a close contact person but his first two tests came back negative. The neighborhood committee tried to hospitalize him nonetheless. I felt quite angry about this because there are so many people who have not been hospitalized at the moment. Why would they quarantine the healthy people? People in all kinds of circumstances are getting rounded up in multiple parts of Hubei province, the epicenter of this outbreak. In Tianmen City, the local government said they picked up people who were disobeying police orders to remain off the streets and have confined them to a gymnasium, all part of the strict lockdown policies. After Wong complained to local health officials Wednesday, she acknowledges they responded swiftly. The next morning, she says she and six others who had likewise already recovered were transferred back to the hotel quarantine. She's still bothered by how officials initially handled the matter. They couldn't provide me with a hospital when I was sick. Now when I'm recovered, they forced me into one. David Culver filing that report. The World Health Organization says right now there are nearly 77,000 confirmed cases of the virus and at least 2,250 deaths worldwide. A heroic Chinese doctor who put off his wedding so that he could treat virus patients has died from the disease. 29-year-old Dr. Peng Yinhua worked at a hospital in Wuhan. More than 500 inmates have been infected by the disease. The biggest outbreak of nearly 300 cases is at the Wuhan women's prison. The warden has been fired. It's been one year since Pope Francis's historic summit to address clergy sex abuse. And tonight, survivor victims gathering in Rome say the Pope's fight to protect young and vulnerable people is gaining steam. Great progress has been made and more is needed. Melissa Butts has that report from St. Peter's Square. To be back at the Vatican seems like deja vu for Peter Isley, a childhood victim of clerical sex abuse. He recalls his time in Rome just a year ago for the sex abuse summit called for by Pope Francis. The founder of Ending Clergy Abuse says until there is no more abuse, he will continue to advocate for victims. Yet he admits in the course of the year, he has seen some progress. One is that uh, for the Vatican State, there's going to be uh, a change in their statute just there for child sex abuse. The second change was about whistleblowers, you know, that if you report, uh, you're, there's going to be no reprisal or whatever if you do it. 
Isley named the third change as the destruction of papal secrecy. He said while it's taken time, the United States has especially made moves to fight abuse. Additionally, dioceses throughout the world have organized church offices to receive abuse cases, and the legal process has been clarified in many areas. As a survivor, he admits he would like more done to protect each and every member of the church. And as an activist, he says he will continue to fight until this safety is achieved. Advocacy organizations ending clergy abuse and bishops' accountability organized events in Rome throughout the week to highlight the changes made, ask for more transparency, and demand yet again zero tolerance. At the Vatican, Melissa Butts, Curtin's News. Here in the United States, much has been done to combat sexual abuse long before the Pope's monumental summit. The United States bishops have been credited for being on the forefront of policies that have been enacted by the Universal Church. For example, in the U.S., a policy of zero tolerance has been in place since the 2002 Dallas Charter. In addition, the U.S. bishops have long had an existing framework that includes victim outreach, reporting allegations to civil authorities, and lay expertise on review boards. Father Hans Zollner is a top Vatican leader in putting the summit's results into action. He's on the Pope's Commission for the Protection of Minors. The priest says there's no turning back in the drive to make the church safe for everyone. We have had a, a number of changes in the law of the church. Most of them have been introduced by the new law with the title, You are the light of the world. The Holy Father is continuously pushing uh, forward and we, I believe that uh, this is a, a process that can't be stopped. The most important thing that we need to learn uh, and I would say many have learned is that victims need to be listened to. The Pope's actions that Father Zollner is talking about have long been in place in the Diocese of Brooklyn under the leadership of Bishop Nicholas de Marzio. There are strong programs to protect minors. Some of the measures include creating the Office of Victim Assistance to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The office provides counseling, referrals for therapy, and other important resources. Every employee of the Brooklyn Diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. In the Brooklyn Diocese, Bishop DiMarzio meets with survivors and listens to them carefully. One result of those talks is the annual Hope and Healing Mass. To contact the diocese's toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line, dial 888-634-4499. There's a lot more news headed your way. A fiery crash put a truck driver's life in jeopardy. Never underestimate the power of a mom, even a brand new one. Lent is days away. Bishop DiMarzio is here to talk about Ash Wednesday and the holy season. Plus, there's good news tonight about the rebuilding of Notre Dame Cathedral. Never underestimate the power of a mom, even a brand new one. Just days after giving birth to a baby, a woman in Indianapolis risked her life to save a stranger who was in a fiery crash. We see a plume of smoke, like huge smoke. Like it looked like a warehouse was on fire. A massive fire shutting down two interstates could be seen from miles away. But Holly McNally had a much closer view. And I slowed down and I saw the actual semi on fire. And then um, I looked to the front of the semi and I see a man on fire. Holly was on her way home with her mom and pulled up on the truck driver right after he crashed into the barrier, watching as fire consumed him and his truck. And I'm scanning and people are videotaping and watching, but nobody's running over there. So I told my mom, I said, I'm stopping and I'm going over there. Holly and another man both ran to the driver and quickly put out the fire on him before realizing the worst was yet to come. We got him out and we start to walk away and I see this huge like stream of liquid and I could smell it. I said, Jeff, honey, what were you hauling? And he said, jet fuel. And I was like, oh my gosh. Her shoes now soaked in jet fuel. Holly knew they had to move quickly, especially knowing who was waiting for her at home. And we're trying to carry him down and it's like getting closer and closer. And I, the second explosion went off. 
and like smoke was hitting us and I was like, you know, just praying like, God, please let me get out of here so I can go see my baby. That's him. My little man. A few days earlier, Holly gave birth to a son, Connor. He was still in the NICU at the hospital where she had just been minutes before pulling up to the fire. But what if that's my son? What if that were Connor, you know, when he's 30? Would you want somebody to just leave him there? Fortunately, the three of them made it before the fire spread. She hopes her story of selflessness might encourage others to do the same. My mom was like, you know, I can't believe you just didn't run away. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to leave somebody. But I wish everybody was like that. You know what I mean? Like everybody, like I said, I think everybody should help everybody. The 59 year old truck driver was taken to the hospital in critical condition. State police believe speed contributed to that crash. The crypt and parts of Notre Dame Cathedral's plaza are expected to reopen this spring. This after an extensive lead pollution cleanup following that massive fire that tore through the church last April. The cathedral itself won't be opening anytime soon. French President Emmanuel Macron has estimated the restoration period will take at least five years. Notre Dame won't be distributing ashes next Wednesday for the first time in memory. The day marks the beginning of Lent, the penitential season to prepare Catholics for the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Bishop DiMarzio is with Ed Wilkinson to talk about one of the most important times on the church's calendar. Ed. Thank you. We're going to talk today with Bishop DiMarzio about Lent and Ash Wednesday. Bishop, here it is again, it seems like. Back again. <laughs> Ash Wednesday, you know, we see a lot of people come to the churches for some reason. It almost seems like there are more people than come on Sunday to Mass. What is the attraction of ashes? Why do people continue to respond to this? Well, there's a lot of different, I think, motivations. But down deep, I think it's a recognition on the part of people that they're, they're human, they're, they fail. Ashes remind us of that, and also that we're mortal. Uh, remember, men, you are dust, and to dust you will return. Uh, that's the injunction for, uh, for many would, would use. So uh, people come, and there's that residual Christianity. If they don't go to church any other time, they come there. And it's, it's, can't say it's wrong, but again, hopefully it's, it's a spark that lights a fire of faith that allows them to continue understanding how to worship God and how to be a good person. Mm -hmm. What do the ashes symbolize themselves? Well, the, the basically death. I mean, it's the burning of the palms from the last Palm Sunday. Uh, it's destruction. And we want to destroy sin in our lives so that we can be prepared to celebrate Easter with all its joy and glory. Mm -hmm. There are two different formulas that you could use. The other one is repent and change your ways, right. something like that. Yeah. Do you prefer one or the other? Well, sometimes in the, in the line I will use one or the other just to, uh, you know, randomly. Uh, each one of them has something to say. Mm -hmm. What is the importance of Lent? You know, we have this every year, the season comes around, and uh, why it's does a, the church have Lent? It's a time of preparation for Easter. It is the center of a fact of our faith that Christ rose from the dead, that we too are promised the resurrection, or that we are immortal, uh, our souls continue to live with God. I mean, that's pretty uh, basic, uh, and that we need to, to, to take time to recognize that's what we're preparing to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And that's why we, we do works of, of penance and prayer, fasting, etc., so that we are more prepared to receive the grace of that mm -hmm. feast. Now, the rules and the regulations for Lent used to be much more stringent that's than they sure. are now. You know, I mean, we remember the fish on the calendar and all half that fish. kind of stuff. <laughs> Ember days and things like uh -huh. that. Why did the church decide to ease up on a lot of those rules? Well, it became uh, complicated for people, and uh, the, maybe the the reasoning behind it was lost, uh, leaving more to uh, the individual conscience to, f to figure out what they could do by means of good works, also by fasting. It was under Paul the Sixth that this was changed after the Vatican Council. Uh, but the whole the letter was called penitamine, which means let us uh, do penance. Mm -hmm. And this was, he outlined the more personal responsibility for penance, not just following rules and regulations. Yeah, and it's penance and mortification, but also in there now is almsgiving, you know. Well, how does yeah. that uh, sneak in there? That wasn't always emphasized in the past. Well, it wasn't emphasized, but it's part of the gospel. Jesus said that himself, you know, that's, so that's all part of it. 
Um, so that's sacrifice also, but for the good of other people. So all of it together is a, a Lenten program. Yeah. What can parishes do to help people celebrate or observe, not celebrate, so observe the yeah. season of Lent? Well, a lot of parishes have special programs uh, for Lent. Uh, um, s people come in for updating on the faith. Um, there are many programs available out there, and many parishes do them. Uh, and there's a, that, that opportunity to uh, Stations of the Cross, usually once a week, and many other devotional things that m prepare us for Easter. Mm -hmm. Great, Bishop. We hope you have a good Lent. And uh, same with all our viewers. Uh, right now, we're going to go back to the news desk. Thank you, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. As the bishop said, there are new Lenten regulations this year. You can find all of them in the latest edition of the tablet. The newspaper is available at your parish. Even better, sign up to subscribe to the paper at thetablet.org. Still to come on Currents News, there are high expectations as the Vatican gets ready to open up one of its secret archives. And he marched for freedom. Now, one of the giants of the civil rights movement is marking a special day. For years, historians have been calling for it, and soon it's going to happen. The secret World War II archives of Pope Pius XII are set to be opened on March 2nd. Critics of the Holy Father accused him of not doing enough to confront the Nazis and protect the Jewish people. Modern research has found that Pius did a lot. Experts are warning it's going to be a long process of examining the archives. The Vatican has prepared a visual preview of what lies ahead. A Vatican cardinal is saying the church is not afraid of history. More than 150 historians and researchers have signed up to get a look at the archives. And finally, tonight during this Black History Month, we celebrate the birthday of a civil rights leader. Representative John Lewis is 80 years old today. The Democrat from Georgia is serving his 17th term in Congress. During the 1960s, Lewis was the youngest keynote speaker at the 1963 March on Washington. And in 1965, he helped organize the Selma to Montgomery marches fighting for the right to vote. That is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.